So, hello and welcome to ARC uh, 281. We are again online. Um, hopefully for you guys it's going to be a little bit easier than it was last year. You know, I've spent the past year figuring out best ways to record lectures. I've bought video cameras. I've bought a new microphone. I have a fancy arm stand to hold up the camera now. Uh, I know how to do in-screen double record captures of my computer. Uh, so hopefully we're going to get through this together. I'm Shannon Hilchey. I'm a structural engineer. Uh, I have been teaching at U of T since 2014. I also have my own company, Practicing Structural Engineers. So I still am working uh, in the industry. So most of the things I talk about are quite relevant and things I'm experiencing right now. Um, before that, I was uh, an associate at Blackwell Engineering. Um, my husband, partner in life, is the owner of Blackwell. Dave, say hi. Uh, Am I it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Is this thing on? <laughs> testing, testing. Uh, so he will obviously sometimes be appearing in the background. You might hear him yell out a comment or a suggestion. Uh, we also have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. Last year they were home all the time. Uh, my five-year-old, who they were two and four last year, the four-year-old was doing online uh, school. He did J he was doing SK. He starts senior kindergarten tomorrow. It's his first day uh, of in-person school, like in class. Uh, so that should be a little bit easier. Um, as you can imagine, when they're that small, you can tell them to stay in the other room, but sometimes they just come running in. That said, um, both the school and the daycare have policies that if anyone in the household has so much as a stuffy nose, the kids stay home that day. Uh, so we may have one or two lectures where you will see my small children running around. Hopefully they're behaving themselves and not uh, causing too much of a distraction. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit uh, about myself and then we'll start getting into it. Today's lecture is very easy. It's very low key. It's mostly just to introduce you to the concepts that we're going to talk about throughout the term. You will have an assignment and you will have a quiz. Um, but a lot of the assignment is um, what I would call participation marks. Uh, and the quiz, as long as you go back and look at your slides, uh, don't rush through the quiz. You have 20 minutes, but it shouldn't take you 20 minutes. Take the time to look at uh, the slideshows and figure out your answers. Don't open the quiz until you're ready to start it, though, because once you open it, the 20 minutes start. So let's start looking through things. So I just wanted to kind of give you a background of who I am and what I do. Um, when I was with Blackwell Engineering, which is which is a large-scale firm in the city of Toronto, I mean I personally think best structural <laughs> engineering <laughs> firm uh, in Canada, um, but uh, really I got to work on some extraordinary projects. I was so lucky to kind of get to work on some of these truly amazing projects. So this is the Canadian Peace Bridge Plaza. Um, I just realized I didn't make my mouse bigger. So I'm gonna do that right now. These are, these are some of the things that I learned last year that you guys find quite helpful. So I've made it bright pink and big enough for you guys to see. So I can put, point around with my mouse now. Um, so this is uh, glue wham uh, beams resting on very slender columns. Um, and the idea here is that there's a shelter over the cars. If you've ever driven from the uh, Canadian, from the American to the Canadian uh, border, if you had to have your car searched, this is where it would have happened. But at least you had a beautiful thing to look at while it was happening. This is the um, Native Child and Family Services headquarters uh, in Toronto. Um, gorgeous building, amazing, amazing um, uh, 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 kind of um, facility, um, working uh, based with and working with children, um, Native children. I guess in in Indigenous would be the more proper term now, but this is the name of the foundation. So uh, I will refer to it as Native Child Family Services. Uh, so this is their headquarters in Toronto. 
Um, an old building that they took and repurposed, um, they did a lot of amazing things in this building. The thing that is most recognizable is inside the building on the main floor um, to do some of their um, rituals and services in, um, they wanted a modern take on a longhouse. Um, and so Levitt Goodman Architects came to Dave and I and said, help us come up with something. So we did some research and we looked at um, uh, a bunch of different schemes. One of the things we were really interested in at the time was reciprocal frames. And re reciprocal frames, when you take small elements and work them together in such a way that they can span longer distances than you would expect. And that was, um, that's a practice that comes directly from indigenous styles of construction back when you didn't have long enough material to build the size of structures you wanted to build. Um, that was especially handy in this where they had um, volunteers coming in to help erect the structure. Uh, so we came up with a really cool system. Um, we were doing it back before there was really much 3D software. So we modeled it in 3D CAD. I, mo I modeled it in 3D analysis software, and then uh, Dave and I drew it in 3D CAD. And we sent it to the architect, and then we said, this, we think this is a good scheme. Tell us if you like it. Uh, they liked it so much that we didn't even produce a set of contract documents. They took that and they sent it to the team that was making all the wood, MCM 2000, and they uh, they fully created it from our 3D CAD. So it was a really fun, exciting project to work on. On the roof um, is where some of our engineering skills really kind of took off on this one. Uh, they had an old concrete roof that was just designed for some snow loads. And they wanted to pile up large mounds of soil so that they could essentially have a playground space up on the rooftop. And we're talking 10 feet of soil in spots. So they wanted it to be rolling hills up there. Uh, obviously the existing roof couldn't be designed to take it. And we couldn't just add topping to the roof because the reinforcing <coughs> in the roof was doing all the work at the bottom. So adding more concrete uh, and adding steel in the top didn't help because that bottom steel couldn't even support the weight of the concrete anymore. So we came up with a load sharing technique where we had steel working below the concrete. And the steel was very, 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 very strong, uh, but not very stiff. And so we built it below the concrete and then we put hydraulic jacks in between the steel and the concrete and we jacked the concrete up to the limit that the concrete could take. And then any load applied after that would actually unload the concrete for the upward forces. So we pushed it up and now the load applied on it would push it down and transfer the load into the steel. It was a gorgeous, beautiful set of steel and they had to come in and fire spray it. In fact, I recently saw uh, Bosco and Verity contractors post some images of it. They sent them to me. We didn't get any beautiful pictures of that steel, so I'll have to add it into this slideshow because they just contacted me a couple weeks ago with the pictures. And we built this in, was it 2008? Yeah, it was a 2008 project. Uh, Drew Mandel Architects, a great um, uh, home designer, uh, architect in Toronto, um, does a lot of beautiful, beautiful work. Uh, this is um, a house that it's hard to tell, but there is nothing supporting this. It cantilevers out over the swimming pool, providing shade right here, but there was nowhere to put columns and nowhere to put our truss elements for the backspan. So this was a really cool, we actually switch the trusses for the backspan into the floor and into the ceiling of the system. Canopy for the Sisters of St. Joseph's project. Um, uh, this canopy is absolutely stunning. I believe that is about three meters in length. Um, it's made out of core 10 steel uh, and it's built up and there are ribs above it. So you can't see it from below, but there are ribs above it um, doing a lot of the work there. So this is with Shim Sutcliffe Architects. Um, I believe most of you will run into during your time uh, at Daniels, um, Alyssa or Peter North um, with North Design Studio and they did the Verdant Walk. This was um, erected in um, the mall 
of uh, Cleveland, I believe. And the mall is really just an outdoor green space. And so this was an installation that was there for a few years. And I believe it's traveled around to a few places now. The facade for Lassonde Engineering Building. Um, this was a, a truly remarkable project in that um, we were working in 3D in such a way that they needed to be building the concrete building, the steel portion, and the windows simultaneously. On a building like this, normally you would build the concrete, then the steel guys would come in, measure everything, go back to their shop, create their shop drawings, build the steel, come back and install it. Then the window guys would come in and measure everything, go back to their shop, make shop drawings, and then fabricate it and come back and install the windows. They needed the window team to be making the windows, the steel team to be creating the steel, all while the concrete was being poured. Concrete can be very precise, plus or minus an inch, probably. I mean, I'm somewhere in that range. Uh, so we needed lots of tolerance in this. So um, Arup was doing the concrete building, but the facade wasn't in their contract. So they came to uh, Blackwell and Fat Lab, Fat Lab being my company, and asked us to come up with a scheme that would allow them to meet all those criteria. It was also very fast tracked. Uh, so we came up with a system that created these steel frames that could be then just slipped in between the floors of the concrete building. Sounds simple enough, right? Except that there were eight different radii on this building and the windows weren't just set out some amount from the building. They were uh, made out of triangles and they were all articulated at different planes. So even within a single window opening, there would have been facets in that window. Uh, so we needed to know these exact points on each one of these windows that was out some varying amount from some varying radii. Uh, so the work was really very in-depth geometric work. They actually had a mathematician create the triangular patterns that was repeating, um, I, I believe he took, the base core of it was three different triangle shapes that then assembled into nine different patterns that then were randomized around the building to lead you to believe it was very, very random. But it was actually quite, uh, you didn't want your eye to pick up the pattern, but there was some patternization there, but it was really hard to detect visually. Um, uh, I remember when I was doing this, I had six weeks to create 137 panels. The first panel took me three weeks to create. So as you can imagine, I was feeling quite um, flustered. The second panel took me three days. The third panel took me three hours. Uh, so after that, that first panel was kind of figuring out the complexity and solving all the problems. And after that, it went uh, much quicker. What was interesting about this project is that it was actually, um, uh, they used it for the, they, there was no shop drawings. They took this and they actually cut the steel based on my drawings. We also had to come out up with a way to do um, checks on it. Um, normally we'd have the opportunity to go review something, but we needed to be able to check if the tolerances that we had laid out of 3.2 millimeters, like 3.2 millimeters is so tiny, uh, we needed a way to verify that these were actually fabricated within those 3.2 uh, millimeter tolerance. So. Um, that was a whole separate contract of, of verifying those dimensions. This one, hopefully you'll all have the opportunity to go in this building this year. Uh, this is the Varsity Center for High Performance Sports with Pat Cow Architects and MJMA. Uh, it's um, a multi-story building uh, that has tiered floors on the inside. The entire structure, <coughs> the second, third, the second and third floors are hung from the underside of the fourth floor with trusses spanning in the long direction of 54 meters um, on each of the major bays, except for the front and the back. Those look like they come down and touch the ground, but they actually don't because underneath this space right here, we can't actually sit this down right here because underneath here is a gymnasium or a field house. So this is where it came down and actually just took out our lateral load. So lateral are the things that make a building go sideways. 
And that's where it came down and took out the lateral loads in the building. Right now, um, right over here, they are in the process. You're at construction document phase now, correct? For uh, the, the tower? Yeah, we, yeah, we just started C's. Yeah. Um, so there is a, and it's 14 stories now? Yeah. 14 story mass timber tower going right here. And what you can't see in these drawings is there's actually um, a loading bay right here. And so when we designed this building, they knew it was going to be very disruptive to try to do the foundations for a future envisioned tower. We didn't know what the tower was going to be. We didn't know what it was going to look like. We hoped it would be the same team designing it, but even that wasn't guaranteed. So we came up with a foundation system that could incorporate multiple options of a tower. Uh, at the time, mass timber wasn't even on anyone's radar as the tower material to be built out of. Um, so it's come a long way since then, and now they're building this 14-story mass timber tower plopped on top of uh, the, the, the steel loading bay and concrete foundations that we did below in 2012 and 2013. Okay, so let's talk about the course now. Sorry. I am not evil, I promise. I do not want you to fail. There's a lot of paperwork for me if you fail this course. Don't make me go through that. Don't do that to me. Make my life easy. I have found in the past that people that do the assignments and do the quizzes, just do them. You have the PowerPoint presentations there. You have my recorded lectures. You will be able to get the majority of your points that way. If you just commit to watching the lectures and doing those assignments and quizzes, most people do very well in this course. In fact, I've gotten in trouble for how well people do in this course. I've kind of finally convinced them that because there are actually right answers, I can't penalize people just because I feel like it. There are right answers. Um, I don't tell them that I make it as easy as possible for you to know these right answers because if I can teach you the material, and you can get the right answers, that's just a solid win for everybody. So let's look at the breakdown of the course. So the marks, part one of the marks is 30% for assignments. There are 12 assignments. I don't think he knows quite how <laughs> disruptive him looking for a snack is. <laughs> Sorry everyone, Dave's hungry. <laughs> Um, so 30% is going to be assignments. There are 12 assignments, each worth 2.5% of the term each. You have a full week to complete the assignment. Once you open it, there is no time limit on the assignment. You can take the full week to complete it. If the end of the week, if the end of the time slot is reached, it will auto submit your assignment. So Try to save or submit it before that, just so you can make sure there's no weird quirks in the system. Uh, it will be found on Quericus on the day of class. Our assigned day before they made us asynchronous was Thursday. So I am treating that as the day that we start everything. I might have lectures posted before that, but to me, Thursday is the day. So the assignment will be found, able to be found on Quericus on the Thursday of each week. So for this, it'll be Thursday the 9th. Uh, it'll be available for one week, week and will auto submit at 11.59 p.m. on the next Wednesday, unless you submit it ahead of that. Um, you will be able to see your mark, but not the answer until the next day. Once everyone submitted their assignments, I will upload an answer sheet and I will make your answers visible so you can see where you went wrong. So you'll have access to all of that. That will be downloaded to the module on Quercus. Um, there are tutorials that I'll talk about in a minute on Fridays. So the assignment is available on Thursday. You should take a few minutes, look through it. You don't have to answer it yet. And then take the time to talk to the TAs. We're going to talk about the quiz in a minute too. But those TAs are there to help you answer the questions or at least work through it. They're not there to give you the answers. I'm also very happy to have you work with your classmates. That doesn't mean find the smartest person in the class and have them give you all the answers because some people have different answers. 
There are similar questions sometimes with slightly different answers, but you guys can work together uh, to talk it through and find the procedure. And there will be math in these. It's not gonna be hard math, but there will be math in it. Um, all of the assignments have an equal weight of 2.5%. You will see points assigned to it in Quercus. That's just how the mark breakdown is within each assignment. So one might look like it's 19 points, one might look like it's five points. Don't get fussed about that. They're all worth 2.5% of your term. And I will download all of the information from Quercus and I turn that into a percentage of 2.5%. If you cannot meet the deadline, please let me know prior to the deadline. There's not much I can do for you after the deadline. Um, if you have left your assignment until the last day and you're sick on the last day, it's really hard for me to find a reason to grant you an extension. Obviously, there is a lot going on in the world this year, and if you are sick, if there's something going on, you don't have to tell me what it is, but if you want to, I'm here to listen. Uh, but I will do whatever I can to help you out. I also fully believe that people screw up sometimes and I will do what I can to help you out once or twice. If I see a pattern emerging, there starts to be little I can do because I am answerable to an administration. So they do check in, sometimes they go in and kind of look around Quercus and see how things are working out and they will ask me these things. So the quizzes, very similar to the assignments except that there is 20 minutes to complete it. So this is timed. They're not going to be as hard a question as in the assignment. Um, so they'll be a little bit easier, uh, but the idea is the same. It'll be available on the Thursday and available for one week until the 11.59 p.m. on the next Wednesday. If you haven't finished it, it will auto submit, but then I would assuming that you would only have started it within 20 minutes of midnight. Uh, again, you'll see your mark, but not your answer until I post the answer sheet the next day. Um, again, you can use TAs for questions, but they can't answer it. I would recommend doing your quiz after you've had your TA session or your tutorial, just in case there's something that tweaked your memory or something you thought about. I would definitely suggest at least trying the assignment first because you might work through any problems that stumped you while you have the time to talk to the TAs and talk to your classmates. And then when you get to the quiz, you might find it a little bit easier if you've already completed those things. Uh, again, they all have equal weight of 2.5% and I adjusted at the end of the term. For both the quiz and the assignment, you're gonna want a calculator on hand. The exam, yes, I know, there's an exam. It's worth 40% of the term. Before you freak out, I just wanna tell you that in engineering, it was common for either to have a 100% final exam, so it didn't matter what you did all term, it came down to three hours at the end of the term. Um, uh, sometimes we would have 10% for assignments and then 90% for the exam. And that was not an uncommon thing. So I'm gonna be nice, I'm gonna make the exam only worth 40%. Not everyone gets the same questions, but the difficulty level is fair. So I will create a question of a certain difficulty level and have three or four variations of it um, that is assigned randomly to vary it throughout um, your version of the exam that comes up. There's all different times of questions, similar to the assignments and the quizzes. There'll be multiple choice, maybe fill in the blank. There will definitely be math, there will be matching. I am very sensitive to um, uh, any sort of um, learning difficulties that people might have. Um, I found a long time ago that the matching questions, uh, in even in paper exams, I thought they were absolutely horrible. Like you labeled something one, two, three, four, and five, and then there's A, B, C, and D, and you have to match. It was just horrible. What I try to do is I assign them a color. Um, so within the image or the question, I'll assign them a color and then write that out in the answers. But again, 
because uh, and I make I try to as much as possible make them the color but again acknowledging that somebody might be colorblind I actually write the word for the color just so it's like I mean you know what I could have done apples and bananas and oranges and grapes and pears uh, but I find the colors easy because for some people that aren't colorblind I can at least make them a color visual for people so I am trying to be very sensitive to that sort of thing Obviously where it's online, I'm assuming we're gonna be doing online. There is a chance they'll have us do it in person. I am pushing hard for the exam to be online. It will be an assigned time slot, not by me. Don't ask me when the exam is. I have, I just realized I'm blocking just a tiny little bit of this, but most of you are probably following along anyway. Um, uh, they will, the university assigns the time slot uh, to us in the exam period, but I will create it on Quercus. I find out the exact same way you do when this exam is by going to look at the examination timetable. So I have no control over it. I don't know when it is. Don't ask me about it. Um, you can tell I get asked this a lot because I'm really stressing this. Uh, it's obviously going to be open book. I will provide an appendix though that is a lot of the um, hot button things that we've talked about and you're going to find that throughout the term I upload a lot of PDFs that might be 5 to 30 pages long of tables and data. I don't think it's that fair for you to print it all off. I think that's a bit excessive. Um, I will expect you to have downloaded it and opened it at some point but for the exam I will take the pages from those tables that I think are relevant and turn them, so if there, if it was a 30 page table and only one page is needed in the exam, I will include that one page in this appendix. So most of the questions, you don't need to look at more than this appendix while you're completing the exam, but you have the ability to look at anything else if you want it. Um, studying for the exam. I don't create a practice exam simply because the assignments and the quizzes are considered your practice exam. Um, that is the purpose of the assignment and the quiz. Uh, obviously the exam is going to be somewhere between the quiz and assignments in difficulty. The assignments are the far end of the questions and the quiz is the low end of the questions. Um, and there will be some uh, amount in there. Now again, I have said that I don't want you to fail this. I am very good at giving you tips throughout the term about what makes a great exam question. Create yourself a little Excel spreadsheet um, and remind yourself that you save in, in your uh, ARC 281 uh, uh, folder of what might make great exam questions because if I'm saying it, it's probably a good odds that it's gonna be in your exam. So the classes are asynchronous. We're 250 students, so that's way too much to fit into a classroom. I'm very glad they're doing this. Uh, I will upload a PowerPoint lecture into that week's module on Quercus. Uh, the first slide will outline the lecture learning points. So it'll say the things we're gonna talk about that day and basically the major headers. The last slide is very similar to the first slide as a little summary. Uh, both the PowerPoint and the video will be posted to Quercus by the class time slot, which I believe for us was around noon on Thursdays. Sometimes it might be posted earlier because I have small kids. I'm trying to get it done um, uh, when they're not around uh, and get it uploaded to you. My ultimate hope is, is that I am going to be in the school on Thursdays and will have my my time, my office hours in that, it's sometime in there. Um, this week I can't come down. Via hasn't, um, I live in Port Hope, uh, which is pretty far from downtown. So I normally would take the Via in. Uh, Via is not running its normal train schedule. Um, uh, and my son starts school on, when I'm filming this on Tuesday, starts school on Wednesday, doesn't have school on Thursday, and then goes back to regular school on Friday. Because it's his very first time in a real school, they're easing them in slowly, because he's just a little guy. Uh, so this Thursday, I can't come down, so I won't be in there for office hours, but feel free to reach out to me. You will also have your tutorial on Friday. 
going forward, my strong hope is that I will be in the building on Thursdays. I am also teaching um, a graduate elective course this term, and that is from 9 to 12 on Thursdays. And my hope is, is that I'll stick around for a couple hours for anyone who wants to meet me. I had begged them to give me an actual classroom uh, because this is the problem. They ask me to post office hours, but there's no office. I have no place to go, and you can't just sit around anywhere anymore in the university. So I'm I'm really kind of baffled about how I'm going to, to work that. I'm going to try to find a place that I can at least be that's reliable and consistent, that's not lurking somewhere, so I can at least work when I'm not talking to someone or if somebody's not coming in to make an appointment to see me. Worst case, we can do uh, appointments virtually in those time slots. That said, um, you should start with your TAs. There are 250 of you, which is a lot. If I gave all of you five minutes every week, I would have no time to sleep. I would love to give all of you five minutes every week, but I don't have that luxury. That's why you have TAs. So 50 of you per TA, uh, start out with them. Um, I'll talk about the TAs again in just a second. Um, but if they can't answer your question, that's when you're gonna come to me uh, and we can work something out. Unless it's about something you're not comfortable talking to the TAs about. Maybe it's about health issues or something that you need dealt with that isn't, isn't in the scope of the TAs and then definitely reach out to me. Um, oh, it says here I'm teaching, that was last year, I was teaching three courses in the fall term last year, which was absolutely bananas. So this year it's only two courses. Um, uh, so make really good use of your tutorials. Uh, oh, did I, didn't, oh, here are the, TA, here are the tutorial, here's the tutorial list. So the idea is that the tutorials are going to be in person. That's, the limit is for in-person is 50 people. Uh, you guys are exactly 50 people. Um, uh, I don't love the idea that you all have to be in a classroom together. That said, I think it's super important that you're all in a classroom together. So uh, I, I, got, I go back and forth on this and I'm following whatever the university outlines. Uh, this week, which is week one, we don't have all our TAs. So far we only have two TAs. We don't have all five TAs. There is no way we can put 125 of you in a classroom with one of the each two TAs. So this week it will be online for sure. Uh, the TAs will follow up at some point with an email or an announcement on Quercus with two video time slots and they'll divide the class into two. You can log in or not. The, tut the tutorials are not mandatory. This is about you, if you have a question, uh, maybe you just want to listen in to hear if somebody else asks a good question. Maybe you just want to have it on uh, so you can work through something and then jump on and ask a question if you have it. Um, maybe you want to ask questions about the information from the week before. Um, the TAs are not structural engineers. You cannot expect them to have all the answers. I don't expect them to have all the answers. Heck, I don't even have all the answers. You guys sometimes come up with really awesome questions that I really have to think about and uh, dig into to find the answer. Uh, so be patient with them. But start with them. If they can handle, you know, 80% of the questions that arise in the course term, then that 20% can fall to me, which allows me to take a bit more time to give it the answer it truly deserves. So let's work together on this. Start by asking the TA and then come along to me. So what's my job? I always, this, these slides always make me look like a complete jerk, but, but I think it's important to outline what the goal is or what my responsibility is. So it's to meet the requirements set out for the class lesson plan. I try to be very clear about what that is. It's to meet the needs of the majority of the class. So what does that mean? Who is the majority of the class? There are always going to be the people that find this course ridiculously easy, and there's always going to be the people that find this course incredibly hard. I will do everything I can for the people that find it incredibly hard, but I can't lower the expectations of the course. I have to meet the mandates of what we've been said. 
For the people that find it extremely easy, great. What you could maybe do is volunteer to help out uh, people that are finding it difficult. Maybe you can work with them. I have in Quarkus set up the discussions tab activated for you guys. So if somebody's confused about something, you don't want to talk to the TA, and you guys, you guys have your own whole thing as well. You guys probably have another platform that you're all working on together. Um, for different things. Maybe you guys are working together and talking to each other there. But if you feel like you're really strong in the course, maybe, or if you feel you're like you're really not excelling at it, try to find people that you can match up with and talk things through. And the last one is be reasonably available. I live in Port Hope and I have two small kids and there's 250 of you guys. Um, I feel like this is the one that people get the most frustrated about in this course. Um, I am trying to do better on that one by trying to be in the building with office hours, but the fact that we don't even have an office for office hours makes it really hard to meet as much of that as I want to. That said, I try to answer emails very quickly when I get them. Um, people will probably see that I answer them as quick as I, like, sometimes it's minutes, you, definitely within the day, unless it's something that, um, isn't time sensitive. Your job, you should watch the videos. Um, I try to keep them, most of them are gonna be under two hours. There's one really intense lecture that sometimes goes to two hours and 10 minutes. Um, I apologize for that, but just take your breath, take a break, you get to pause this, go to the washroom, come back, pause it, have a snack, come back. You guys get to work with this as you want. It's one of the upsides of it being recorded. You should be either following along with the PowerPoint or reviewing the PowerPoint. Uh, you should take a look at examples. I try to do a lot of examples of each type of problem. The harder it is, the more examples I try to do. Uh, you should definitely download all the material. I try to put everything that is relevant for that lecture in that lecture's module, but there's also a downloads module where I'll stick all of the downloads into that as well. Um, you should submit your questions to the TA, whether that's verbally during a tutorial, uh, through an online session with, tut with TAs, um, or last resort to me. If the TAs can't answer your questions, they will pass it along to me. And in fact, I'm expecting at the end of tutorial sessions to get a summary email from TAs with an, a list of any questions that they couldn't answer right there in the tutorial session. You should complete all the assignments and all the quizzes. That is that is seventy that is sixty percent of your mark right there. If you can do all of those and do all of those moderately well, you will do great in this course. Oh, I guess Dave caught a fly. Um, you should also study for the exam. Um, I will talk more about the exam when we get closer to it. The best way to study for the exam is to go through lists, go through equations, uh, look at the old assignments and look at the old quizzes. And if you do all of that, you'll probably find you're in pretty good shape. Study tips. Take notes, but the slides and videos are obviously available to you. Uh, you should write down calculations, lists, and questions. Remember I said maybe open an Excel sheet and like write down things like say this is a good question. Uh, feel free to then just like cut and paste and make your like equation list. Um, I love questions that are lists, like bullet point lists. Um, lists, so listen for my cues. Like I said, I'm very nice about hints. Quizzes make great exam questions and I really like pointing out good exam questions. They, they just, they make themselves. The good ones make themselves. So the other thing I get a lot of flack for is why isn't there a textbook for this course? Guys, I would love it if there was the right textbook for this course, but what we have instead is the Hibbler Statics book. It's one half of an entire textbook called Statics and Dynamics. It runs $180 new. There's Hibbler Structural Analysis, which is $90. Both of those are made for the American code. Statics is pretty easy to work with, but they do half of their examples in Imperial. I do most of our stuff in metric, or I might ask the question in Imperial, but then I get you to convert it to metric so that the answers are always in metric. 
Um, the structural analysis Hibbler one is very much built to the American code. We have to pick a code and we're in Canada, so we're working to the American code. They're all very similar, the principles are the same, but they're slightly different. And so we're working to the Canadian code, which means that one's not as helpful. That means we need to know the code. We need the National Building Code of Canada, or the NBCC, plus the commentaries, which are sold separate from each other. That's $435. We're specifically in Ontario, and the Ontario Building Code, or the OBC, is $90. And that's just the code side. Then we have the material codes. So we need the concrete code. The concrete code is $230. The steel code, which is, how much is the steel code? At uh, $400. Um, and the wood design manual and code, which is $225. That would be absolutely evil if I made you buy all of those. They're all available in the library, but I have created PDFs of the relevant pages that we need from those codes for you to use. So people say, why is there no textbook? Well, all of those downloads I give you, you could put them all together and there's your textbook. Everything you need is going to be in those pages. Um, one of the neat things I have done this term is, and I'll, I'll share it later with you guys, specifically when we get into it. Um, I bought a kid's toy that um, is geared to, actually I have it right here. Let me. Uh, I got it from Indigo. It's the Structural Engineering Bridges and Skyscrapers, specifically um, to help us talk about braced frames and lateral systems. Um, so I've built a few tiny little models that we can look at because people have really struggled kind of with that concept. We're not, that's later in the term, um, but I just thought this was, if anyone finds it very fascinating, uh, feel free to pick one of these up. I think I got it for 70 bucks or something. Um, it's going to be me trying to hide it from my kids because they're going to want to get their hands on it. Now, everybody learns from different people in different ways. Uh, I find most of the students enjoy this course, even if they're terrified of math. Uh, but there's always one or two people who hate it. Like, I'm talking with a passion. They write some horribly mean things in the review commentary. Uh, but most of it is very, 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 very positive. That said, I get it if you learn better in a different way. Obviously, most of the terms I'm talking about, Wikipedia, go look it up if you feel like. Obviously, I'm not trying to quote Wikipedia through all of this, and I don't think Wikipedia should be a replacement for what I'm talking about. But sometimes searching for a term that maybe my voice and my way of saying it isn't getting through to you, look it up. You'll probably find things that help or do an image search. Maybe the image will really drive that point home. These were a set of um, videos uh, made um, to help people pass their, uh, their um, architecture uh, tests in the States. So these were four architects for the structural exam. Um, I've watched most of them. It's very comforting to me that most of the things he says are the exact same thing I say. Uh, I will also point out that um, uh, Dave and I have been doing our masters in Germany for um, uh, tensile fabric structures, although because of the pandemic it's been on hold and now they might shut down the program because of funding. Uh, but Everyone had to take all the courses. There was no exemptions and we went to Germany and one of the courses was the structural engineering course because a lot of the people were also architects, not engineers. Uh, so we sat through the structural engineering course and they literally showed some of the same videos I show, I will share with you throughout this term. Um, most of the concepts and the way they talked about it were very similar. So it was also comforting to see all of these people around the world um, trying to like trying to create these modules of concepts in a very similar way that I have. And I, I did mine independent from them. So let's talk about why. Why are you guys even here? You, you guys are in architecture. But why do you need to know any of this? You're going to hire an engineer. It's somebody else's job to do this. Well, 
before you've ever even hired an engineer, there is a part of the, the design process that you as an architect have to handle. This is the problem with us both sharing an office space. This was my office space, which is really our dining room. Uh, I work from home. It was never supposed to be a recording studio and Dave was never supposed to be sitting right there beside me. Um, Everything okay? Oh, yeah. Uh, so you'll have to bear with us for some interruptions. I'm assuming you have your own distractions at home. Um, you just don't have to share it with 250 other people. So before you've ever even hired your engineer, you have to pick usually what material you want to work with. You've probably done a layout. You've probably done a set of drawings. And you've probably picked out your preliminary sizes. And you do all of that before you've ever even talked to an engineer. So there's a lot you have to have an, uh, kind of an intuition about or an idea of what's going to work because you don't want it to be completely wrong. It can maybe need to be nudged around a little bit when you've hired the engineer, but you want to have a pretty good idea of what this is all going to look like. You also need to have an understanding of material limits. When is something just not possible because you're, you want to use this material? You should understand that some small changes can have a huge impact on the design. So things, if you understand the things that are going to have the biggest impact on the engineer, you can incorporate that early. Um, a big part of that is understanding the relationships between the depth of a member, the length of a member, the strength of a material, and the deflection of an object. And all of those things are related in different ways, and it's important that you have an understanding of what that is. And that's what we talk about in this course. Now, I understand they're difficult concepts, and for some people, it's going to be seen as very difficult math. You're going to need to do the math a few times to understand the concepts. Um, so a big chunk of this lecture, we're just going to touch back on math a little bit. So don't get too overwhelmed. Take a breath. The only thing that's timed for you is a 20 minute quiz and those you should do the assignment first so you can try to work through your problems or your phobias or any issues that you have when you have an opportunity to talk to someone. So let's start lecture one. I'll try to make this not too long. We have about an hour and 10 minutes left to kind of get through this. So first we're going to talk about what is structure. So that's going to be our kind of first talking point. And then we're going to talk about strength, stiffness, and stability. So we're going to do what is structural engineering? Where does structure fit in the design process? We're going to review some basic math, and then we're really going to get into the concept of strength, the concept of stiffness, and the concept of stability. And then I'll do a little summary about what today's takeaway tips should be. So structural engineering, a field of engineering dealing with analysis and design that supports or resists loads. Basically, it holds things up. It is the engineering that tells you what you need to hold up the things you want to hold up. But who's deciding what you're holding up? What are the things you're using to hold it up? There's a lot to structural engineering that isn't the decision of the structural engineer. But we have to work together to figure out what that is. So what is this the concept of design? Now, the, the, I'm not testing you on this. This is just kind of a, a, a mental flow chart, if you will. So I always think of it as a problem definition and a problem solution. And design is kind of this, this part in the middle. Um, engineers love a good Venn diagram, so anywhere you can fit in a de Venn diagram is also great. This changes throughout the design process. So round one, the owner has a problem. They've defined their problem and they go to the architect and the architect defines a solution or figures out the solution. Then the architect has the problems that um, they need solved to make their solution work. They come to the engineer and the engineer comes up with solutions. And then the engineer and the architect have a new set of defined problems that they go to the contractor to solve. 
So the architect is solving the owner's problems, the engineers are solving the architect's problems, and the contractor is usually solving the engineers and the architect's problems. Problems doesn't mean something you created or you dropped the ball, but really the exercise of um, defining the building. I also like to think of it as, I do, I do this twice, I do design as a three-step process, and I think I do it as a six-step process. This one is really, really, really important. Understand your precedence. A big part of design is understanding precedence. The architects don't spend a lot of time talking about precedence just because they're lazy. It is because a lot of problems have already been solved and solved when they didn't know what the solution was. So they've tried a bunch of different solutions and things have been whittled down to the best solution. If it's there as a precedent, it's probably because it's a pretty good solution. So that's why it's a good place to start. If that really good solution doesn't work to solve your problem, that's when you might refine it. You might tweak it. You might change it a little bit, but you're starting with that core solution. It's only when that doesn't work that you would innovate. Innovation is wonderful and beautiful and amazing, but it isn't cheap and it takes a lot of time and it doesn't guarantee success. So starting with the precedent, refining where appropriate, and then jumping into innovation when you need to is the best way to handle the problem. All right, so here's the six step process. This is the more, so those were more kind of theoretical things to think about. This is literally how the design process happens when using your structural engineer. So the very first thing is the architect picks the, uh, the, the system or the material and they figure out a building and a layout. So they figure out kind of what their grid is going to be. Um, and then they'll often um, create a set of drawings and show it to the client. And they might even draw some preliminary sizes in that drawing. And at this point, they usually haven't hired an engineer. So we've got a six meter by six meter grid with beams that are this deep, but you haven't had an engine. So you've got maybe a six meter by six meter steel building with beams that are this deep. You've picked your grid, you've picked your material, and you've picked a pretty darn close to depth size. And that's important because maybe you've got 10 stories and your ceiling to ceiling height needs to be this much. And if this is your beam depth, that's defining how many stories you can fit in to your overall building height. So these are really important decisions to make early. If you go to your engineer and find out your beams needed to be that deep, so this much deeper over every story, so times 10, maybe you knock off a whole story off your building because of your upper bound limits on your building height. So now you've only got a nine story building. Maybe it's not economical for the owner to build it and the whole building's off the table after having gotten pretty far in the project. So you having an understanding of what a reasonable size is for a beam is really, really important. And that's what we call the sizing guidelines. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a rule of thumb. And most industries have that, whether it's engineering, uh, design has it, plumbing has it. Um, most things have a rule of thumb or a sizing guideline. And these are the most of the time, if everything is normal, these things are what you will do. This is what it'll look like. And we're going to spend an entire lecture. Maybe I don't do it. Maybe I do it by material. I might do it by material for you guys. Um, looking at those sizing guidelines. So we break wood into two lectures, concrete into two lectures, and steel into two lectures. And um, each of those, uh, one quarter of those lectures, or maybe even three quarters of one of the, each of those lectures, is spent talking about those sizing guidelines. So by the end of that, you could probably draw a pretty good set of preliminary drawings if you knew what material you were using and the things you were putting on top of it. So that's another big part of it. So then there's usually uh, the engineer takes the drawings and goes away and takes a look at them. Um, sometimes they'll have a little bit of back and forth with the architect, but this is where the engineer figures out all of the loads that act on the building. Some of it comes from the architect. 
you as the architect are picking what the floor materials are. Not the material that builds the structure, but is there, uh, is it carpet or is it um, terrazzo flooring? Is it a dropped ceiling or is it um, sculpted concrete sound baffle panels? Those are all gonna have different weights associated with it. The engineer will calculate those weights, but we have to know what it is that you're putting on it. Um, we also have to figure out the live loads on it. Is it um, where people can gather and dance and move around a lot? Or is it a classroom where we're gonna have too much stuff in the room to really jam pack a lot of people in? What's happening in the environment around the building? What's the wind blowing on it? What's the snow falling on it? What's the seismic load like or earthquake that's gonna shake the building around? The engineer has to figure all that out, but it helps to have communication with the architect. A really good example with that is when something's an outlier. So an engineer would know what was reasonable to put in the building, but the architect should know an outlier. A really good um, uh, example of that is the Goldring Center for High Performance Sports. I often like to draw little things for you guys. Um, I will do calculations where I turn my camera down so you can follow along with me. Um, but sometimes I just like to draw little drawings and I'll hold it up. So this is one that I'm going to talk about right now. We had an MRI in that building. So we had uh, MRIs are really heavy and really vibration sensitive. And we had, this is our Gold Ring Center for High Performance Sports spanning 54 meters with our trusses up on the upper floor, hanging the third and second floor from it. Because down here, We have people playing basketball. Yeah, that's me drawing. It looks like a zero and an equals and a really odd nine. But we have somebody playing basketball. So no columns could come down there. We have an MRI right here. It's very sensitive to vibration. And in fact, most manuals say, do not put these anywhere but the basement on a slab on grade where they're completely impervious to building vibration. Not only did we not do that, we put it on the fourth floor and then right underneath it, well, off a bay, we put an Olympic weightlifting facility right there, sharing a hanger from that floor. Now, if you've never seen Olympic weightlifting, wow, it's intense, man. They pick up those giant weights, hold it, and then throw it down on the ground, and it bounces. Everything shakes and creates a huge amount of vibration. So what do we do to solve that problem? Well, that was an unusual situation and I couldn't have anticipated it. Luckily, the architect knew that it was unusual and told me very early and we were able to design for it. We put um, an isolated floor under the Olympic weightlifting uh, unit. So we actually created it so it would buffer all the vibration. And in fact, I gave a tour of it in 2018 um, uh, while we were having a party downstairs and it was being used as a gym and I, while I gave the tour I had some people stand on the isolated floor while a guy lifted a weight and dropped it and some of us stood on the other floor and the people on the, vi the isolated floor could feel the vibration because they were standing on the same floor uh, the lifter was, and we couldn't feel a thing, even though we were standing like three feet apart from each other. So there are ways to solve almost every problem if we know the problem exists. Uh, we, have, we, um, we have to then figure out what those loads do to every member, every connection, and every system on the building. So all of these people in the building, they're acting on a load down it. They're trying to bend something between these. There's snow on the roof trying to cause load in these trusses. There's wind blowing on it. We have to look at every single member in the building, every connection, so that's where every member connects to something else. And then there's systems too. So this truss is made up a bunch of, of a bunch of members, but it's also acting as a system. 
So we have to look at what those loads do to every member, every connection, and every system in the building. And then the engineer, with a little bit of input from the architect, figures out what member is stable, strong enough, and stiff enough to meet all of those load requirements. And then once we know that, we talk about it, see if any of them are just a complete pain in the ass, and then maybe we have to go back and start the process over again. But the next time you go through, instead of doing everything, maybe you've whittled it down to a few problems you still have left to solve because those ones didn't work, or maybe you'd bonk your head because there's a stair there. Um, but you go through the process several times in designing the building. So part of what we're gonna do is we're going to look at our rules of thumb, we're going to figure out what acts on the building, and then we're going to work through what do those loads do to the members, the connections, and the systems on the building. And then we're actually gonna figure out what members are stable, strong enough, and stiff enough to resist the loads. So we're gonna spend most of this course doing this zone right here. You spend a lot of time doing step one without me in your career. We're here to talk about step through to step five uh, in this course. So structural design to an architect. You need to know how to pick the best system the best layout and the approximate size needed to satisfy that. And the reason I say best, um, we really say best when we're talking about cheapest. Now, people get their backup when I say cheap. Cheap doesn't mean bad. I am not saying sell yourself out here, guys. What I'm saying is, is that might be one of your criteria. Once you've defined your criteria, once that is set, then you should find the cheapest system to make that work or the cheapest member to make that work. Here are the secret weapons you have that engineers surprisingly don't have. You guys spend so much time talking about precedent. In engineering school, we don't look at a single cool building. I think it's getting a little bit better now, but for me, I never looked at a building in its entirety. We learned how to design a member by itself. Um, we learned how to draw, design a truss by itself. But they really didn't give us a whole building to look at. Everything was in isolation. I certainly didn't get to look at cool precedents where we talked through how that building went together and what made up the design for it. The other thing is as much as I'm gonna give you sizing guidelines or rules of thumb, most engineers spend a lot of time designing that we forget that we have the sizing guidelines too. It starts to be really easy for us to think the only way we can know the answer is by doing a bunch of calculations, when really one quick back of the envelope calculation can usually give us our answer. And you guys are going to have that with you. We, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about those sizing guidelines. And you know, when I run into you 30 years from now and you're practicing in the industry and you've hired my old ass to design something for you, I hope you pull out your sizing guidelines, your tattered paper copy of your sizing guidelines to show me while we sit at that meeting. This is something that you should have with you for a long time. Um, they'll also make Great exam questions. Now, <clears throat> I get that some people are just scared of math. Don't worry about it. We're gonna keep it pretty simple. The math we're gonna do sometimes is going to look complicated, but it's all based on things you learned in early high school, maybe even junior high. That said, I know some of you probably haven't done math since maybe middle of high school. Um, depending on what um, undergrad degree you have. It might be a long time since you've picked up a calculator. So take the opportunity to get a little bit of a refresher for yourself. If you think this is going to be the big thing that holds you back, you should reach out to student services, um, see about um, uh, time length increases for things. I can't grant that without um, uh, the accommodations from student services talking to me about it. Um, maybe you need to look into getting a tutorial if math is really hard for you. Um, reach out to your friends, uh, but don't let this be the barrier for you because this is an easy problem to solve. And once you do it a few times, it starts to get really easy. 
So the things we're going to do a lot uh, in this course is you're going to know how to need to know how to use a calculator, exponents, squares, square roots, cubes, cube roots, trig functions. I always called it SOHCAHTOA or S O H C A H T O A. Um, uh, you need to gonna know how to look things up on a chart, which I know you're like look things up on a chart. I don't know how to do that. Some charts can have multiple things on one chart. They can get very confusing. But we're gonna have to talk know how to look things up on a chart. You're gonna know how to look things up on a graph. Uh, you're gonna have to know how to interpolate. Interpolate means what happens when the piece of information you need is in between two points on a graph or a chart. How do you figure out what that number is? You're gonna have to know how to solve for x or solve for an unknown in an equation. You're gonna need to know how to rearrange an equation to solve for that unknown. You're gonna need to know how to take two equations and put them together. And you're gonna need to know units and how to switch back and forth between units. I will say I do the majority of our course in metric. That said, even in Canada, um, a lot of um, residential drawings will be done in Imperial. So you'll see sometimes specifically for the wood projects, I will list the questions in Imperial, but often the answers will be in metric. Um, that's another good point about the quizzes and the assignments. I will always list in the question what units you need and how many decimal points that you need in it. Uh, Quercus is finicky and um, uh, you can't put the units in the answer you type. You just want to put the numbers in it. It will also drop zero. So say I said that it needed an answer to do two decimal points and yours was 7.20. Well, Quercus, after you write it, will make it look like your zero disappeared and it'll be 7.2. But 7.2 is equal to 7.20, so it's fine. Even though Quercus makes your zero disappear, it will still mark it as a correct answer. So let's go through and take a look at some of these. And this was a, a meme I came across, and I kind of liked it because uh, it implied that only people that are bad at math can get upset doing math. No, people tend to take math as far as they can take it. And I have faced math problems that have made me cry. In fact, when I was in university, uh, they engineering tends to be, um, I'm not gonna say full of know-it-alls, but I mean full of know-it-alls, or people that think they're know-it-alls. Uh, and most of them have done pretty well in school throughout their whole career. And um, they pick one course to break us. They purposely want us to cry, uh, and our differential, uh, our differential equations course was that one for me. Uh, the highest mark on the exam was a 40%. Uh, so they set, set out to make us cry. So don't worry about it. Everybody cries about math. You'll get through it. We'll get you past that hump. So exponents, so the base will often write as a B or the exponent we'll use as a placeholder N. That just means squaring it or cubing it or to the power of four or to the power of five or to the power of N as a placeholder. Uh, that is telling us how many times we're multiplying a number by itself. So five squared is five times five. Five cubed is five times five times five. I will tell you that my five-year-old is obsessed with squares and cubes. He knows his, he has his squares memorized up to 20. He fought, he wore me out at 16. I had to show him how to use a calculator and he's memorized a bunch more since that. Um, this is how we got through the pandemic and he knows most of his cubes. He knows his cubes, he knows them up to six uh, and he knows the, he knows 10 cubed as well. Um, and he knows them without a calculator now, which is, he's terrifying sometimes. Roots is just the opposite of uh, your exponent. Um, so uh, it is how many times did you have to multiply uh, a number to get that number? Or how many times, how many, so if it's the cube, uh, cube root of 125, what number did you multiply by itself three times to get 125? So that's the cube root. That can come up in different ways on different calculators. 
this is my calculator. You are going to have a different calculator. Maybe you have this calculator. Maybe you have a different calculator. Different calculators input things in a different order. Um, so you can't ask me how to put it into your calculator because some make you do the function before you enter the numbers and some make you do the function in the middle of it and some make you do it after it. So every calculator is a little bit different. Get comfortable with your calculator. For me, for example, these were the buttons were on my calculator and for uh, anything more than a square root, like a cube root or uh, an n root where maybe it's larger than a cube root, you have to use the second function feature on the calculator. Scientific notation or base 10 exponents. That is telling us how many places we moved the zero over, whether uh, bigger or smaller, or whether we're, what way we're moving that decimal point. So five times 10 to the three means that we would move that decimal place over three spots. So five times 10 to the three is 5,000. Five times 10 to the minus four means that we've moved that decimal place over four spots. There's someone at our door, Dave. Um, five times 10 to the 12, we've moved that decimal place over uh, 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 12 times. Often in Excel, you will see it as E uh, as the times 10 to the, um, uh, I'm going to stop this so Dave can bring someone in. We have a hole in our ceiling. We were spray foaming our ceiling and they fell through the ceiling. So uh, we have to get that fixed. They didn't tell us. They just left and left a gigantic person size hole in our ceiling. They were okay. They were fine. I'm not that cruel. Okay, so they're upstairs now, so I apologize. We might hear them just a tiny little bit. So in Excel, they'll, you may use this E if you're trying to use an, uh, an exponent within Excel. Uh, significant figures, that's the digits that carry meaning in your mathematical number. So 5.2 pounds, there are two significant figures. 1.54 times 10 to the 4 is three significant figures. If that was written as 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 15,400, it would still only be three significant figures. Possibly, it's not exactly clear. 1,100, it's not exactly clear. It's, we know it's at least two significant figures. It could be three, it could be four. Often in this course, three significant figures is fine. It might be four significant figures. Um, if I say, you know, I'll try to be very explicit about how many decimals to put in that answer. So I'll try to, I'll try to lead you into it very clearly what I'm looking for. I'm not trying to trick you, but the reason it's important is that Quercus Ha, uh, has some very specific criteria on how we input things. Now the train is also going by. Hopefully my fancy new mic is making all of these uh, background sounds a lot better. Uh, so how do you input that in your calculator? Well, that's the EXP here. Um, that will give you your uh, five exponent eight means that you have eight zeros after that five. Uh, sometimes you can do it with the 10 to the power of as well. So there's two ways you could enter it in your calculator. Math, trig. Oh, I love trig. I love it so much. All right, first one we're going to talk about is Pythagorean theorem. In a right angle triangle, so right angle means there's one angle that is 90 degrees in this, we have the hypotenuse side. Uh, we have, and then we have two other sides. It doesn't matter so much which one's opposite and which one's adjacent. They're just two other sides in this. What it's saying is that uh, O squared plus A squared equals H squared. So it's not a linear addition. O squared 
plus a squared is going to equal h squared. This means we could arrange it. If we know any of these sides, we can rearrange this to find the side we need. So if we know this dimension and this dimension, we can find this dimension. If we know uh, the hypotenuse and O, we can find A. If we know a O and A, we can find H. You'll also hear this sometimes be referred to as the square root of the sum of the squares. And we use this a lot um, in statistics as well. You'd be surprised to find how much we use it in statistics as well. But it's going to be very handy when we talk about vectors going forward. Um, hold on, I'm going to stop this again. Okay, so I'm realizing I'm, I'm chatting way too much and I'm taking too long with this lecture, so I've got to speed it up a little bit. Um, the next one, still with trig, is looking at um, our right angle triangle with our sine cosine tangents. So in a right angle triangle, if this is our angle of interest, this is the side opposite our angle of interest, and this is the side adjacent to our angle of interest. This is still our hypotenuse because it's the one opposite the 90 degrees. What this law says is the sine of the angle equals the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. The cosine of the angle equals the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. And the tangent of the angle equals the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. So if you know any two of these bits, O, H, A, or the angle, you can figure out the other two bits of information. So you can rearrange those however you need to to find those things out. Here is a... Um, uh, 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 if you need to find the inverse or the, the, if you need to rearrange it to find out what the angle is, you want the arc sine or the arc tan or the arc cos of your, uh, of your information. So this is the one where it drives people nuts in calculators, but you've probably done it way back in the day. So again, this is my calculator. Most people have sine, cosine, and tangent as quick hot button up hot button items, but right above it will be your arc version of it. Um, so you usually have to pick a second function to enter it in. Make sure your calculator's in degrees. I have had people do exams with their calculators in radians uh, or gradients, and it completely messes you up. So take the time to make sure your calculator is in degrees. So. Let's take a look at some examples here. Um, if we had an opposite side equals three, an adjacent side equals six, and we wanted to know the hypotenuse, we can use our square root of the sum of the squares. If you find that you lack practice in um, trig, go through this sheet. I'm not gonna go through it because I feel like most of you would know how to go through this process. Um, and this is just a quick refresher to remind you about it, but if you struggle, you should go through and do some of these. A graph. How do you find out information on a graph? Well, what a graph is telling us is the only data we actually know are the dots. So this is a real piece of data, and this is a real piece of data, and this is a real piece of data. The spots in between the data, we are making an assumption. Often it's a straight line. So you can see this whole thing looks like it's curving, but what we're really doing is drawing these dots, which are our hard data, and drawing a straight line between those points. Um, you will often see most graphs have a little note that say straight line interpolation between known points. So if our length is 3.5 meters, what's the weight? So we have a length we know uh, what our length is at four, and we know what our length is at five, and we know what our length is at six, and we want 5.4 right here. So often what you can do is you can take a calculator and estimate roughly where 5.4 is, 
and then draw across, and it looks like we're pretty close to 30 kilograms. So this was a chart plotting length versus weight. What happens when we're interpolating from a chart? We want to know the same weight of length for 5.4 meters. We have that same data uh, listed as a chart here. So we have 5 equals 25 and 6 equals 36. We want to interpolate between those two points. Again, this is a very exact, inexact method. We're going to be very, very, very precise in our information between 5 and 6. But it's not actually 5.4. It's a straight line approximation between our known data sets right here. And the way we do it is interpolate. We figure out the, dis the difference between 25 and 36, which is 11. And we figure out the difference between 5 and 6, divide that out, figure out where 5.4 relates to on that, and then add back our 25. This one takes a little bit of practice. So 36 minus 25 divided by 6 minus 1, but times our 0.4, which is 5.4 minus 5, plus that 25 that we had over here gives us 29.4 kilograms. Interpolation is one of those ones you should try again and again and again and again and again. Um, go online, check it out, you'll find examples for interpolation. Um, usually when you stop thinking about interpolation, it's really easy to get it. I have this example drawn on the next slide where it shows you really what we're doing is making a similar triangle between these two data points. And some people that helps them really get their head around it. Now. This looks like it's very exact. It's 29.4, it has a decimal, it must be right, versus that 30 kilograms. This is still just an approximation because this was a straight line point between our known data points. So here it is drawn out as a straight line triangle for people who would prefer to look at it that way. And your units, you need to know your units. These are the common ones that we're going to be jumping around between. Uh, a thousand millimeters in a meter, one inch equals 25.4 millimeters, 12 inches equals one foot. One kilonewton is a thousand newtons. What's a kilonewton, you ask? We're going to spend a chunk of a lecture talking about that. Uh, but one kilonewton equals a thousand newtons equals a hundred and 2.06 kilograms, which equals 224.8085 pounds but around 225 pounds is fine for most of the work we're gonna do. Uh, pressure, one MPA equals one Newton per millimeter squared. One MPA equals a thousand KPA. One KPA equals a thousand kilonewtons per meter squared. And moment, which is a type of force that we're gonna talk about, is in kilonewtons and kilonewton meters or one million, one million Newton millimeters. All right, what do we check as engineers? What are we doing here? We have three things we're worried about. We're worried about strength, the amount of load a structure can sustain prior to failure. That means rupture, excessive permanent deformation, or buckling. This is a life safety issue. We're talking about failures that cause, that could result in death of a, in a building. We worry about stiffness. So stiffness is deflection, but it's not this excessive permanent deformation. We're talking about deflection, how much things move around. And that's the amount of force required to make a structure deflect by some fixed increment. This is not about life safety. It's almost always about people's perception. And then stability the state of being stable, or the opposite of being instable. I know, the stupidest definition ever. Instability can be elastic, ponding, tipping, or sliding. But what am I talking about? Is this stable? Well, kind of looks like it's stable. That is not stable. If you stand, I wonder how much you guys can see of me if I, if I stand here. Um, I'm wearing a dress, so it's not that great. Yeah. I don't want to stand up on that. 
Um, can I? All right, if I stand like this, I'm stable. But if somebody pushed on me right here, I could tip over. This foot isn't held down to the ground. In that load case, I'm not stable. So there's different, under different load cases, you could have different criteria that is needed for your stability. So it's part of looking at the system under different load conditions. Now, I always say that everything you need to know about engineering, you already know. You intuitively usually know when something's stable. I'm going to make you draw it and tell me what makes it stable, and you're going to panic and forget everything that makes it stable that you already intuitively know. If you ask a little kid if something will stand up, they can often tell you if it won't. Is it going to tip over? How is it going to fail? They often intuitively know. I'm going to teach you a bunch of stuff, you're going to get scared, you're going to forget everything you know, and then I'm going to try to make you bring it back to what you already intuitively know. Stiffness is a little bit different. Um, strength, I think people have a pretty good grasp of intuitively when they think it looks too small to work as well. Now, strength, stiffness, stability, we check for every connection, every element and every system within a building. We have to do these three things for each one of those, for every element in the building. And then again for its connections, and then for how they assemble as a system. So say a truss or a lateral system. Um, uh, and we'll sometimes do it again and again and again and again. So strength, like I said, is about life safety. A long time ago, and this is not what we use anymore, we used to use a design method called factor of safety. And what we did is we took the load on the system, we knew that we had a capacity and we didn't want it to fail, and we have a load, and we wanted to make it extra safe so we design it for a little bit more. So what am I saying with that there? So if we have this table right here, we have this table, and it needs to hold up Shannon sitting on this table. Well, we know how strong this table is. Maybe this table can hold a certain amount, and we need to make sure that that amount is more than Shannon. So I'm the load on the system. The capacity is how much it can hold. Well, what happened if I go out and eat a cheeseburger and have a beer at lunch, and I come back, and this was perfectly designed for my load? What happens after my burger and beer? And I sit back up on the table. Well, now the table is going to fail. And we didn't have any buffer at all in that system. So we like to make sure, or we used to design it so that we had a factor of safety. And the factor of safety, it, it, depend, it depended on how, what kind of design it was, but it would vary. Um, that uh, was great and worked for a very long time, but didn't give us very refined methods of doing it. What we do now is the difference in the types of loads can be very different. Um, there are certain load types that can have more variability than others. It, the table also had to hold up its own self-weight, and we picked what that table was. It's one inch thick piece of wood. Well, what happens if it was 1.1 uh, inches thick. It's a little bit thicker than we wanted, so there needed to be a little bit of buffer there in our design or our capacity. Um, so we, uh, we assign different loads, different factors. Now, what, happen if, what happens if that piece of wood maybe had a little bit of flaw on it? What, it was, was, what if it wasn't all about the loads on it? So what we do now is we still follow this idea that the capacity has to be greater than the load on the system. But what we do now is we increase the load on the system and we vary it depending on what type of load it is. And we're gonna spend a whole lecture talking about that. And we decrease the capacity of the material. So we factor the load and we reduce the capacity and that reduced capacity needs to be greater than the factored load. 
We like to give things symbols, so we'll often use this symbol for factoring and this symbol for capacity. And then we like even more symbols, so we will often, if we were talking about things and I said, oh yeah, the load on it is 25. Well, you don't know if I'm talking about the factored load or the unfactored load. So we'll often use this little subscript F to let somebody know we're talking about the factored load. So if I said, oh, the, the factored load is 25, you'd know. But writing it down, we would do PF or that load with a little subscript F means I've already applied my factors. A subscript R means we've already reduced the capacity. If you don't see that F and the R, they haven't been factored and they haven't been reduced and you need to do it. This is called limit state design. And that's the method we do now. We do not do factor of safety, we do limit state design. Why am I repeating this again and again and again? Because I guarantee you it's a question in your assignment, it's a question in your quiz, and it's a question on the exam. And inevitably, when I say, what method do we use now today in Canada, people pick factor of safety and I wanna lose my mind. All right, what types of loads do we have? And you're thinking, types of loads? There's different types of loads. Well, yes, there is. This is my handy foam block. You're going to see me use it a lot to demonstrate different things. Compression is when we squash something. Now, my foam block is a little bit hard to squash because it's so squishy, but it's when we do that. Tension, I wonder if I have an elastic. Oh, tension is when we pull something. An elastic is pretty great to show it. But look, what happens when I do compression on an elastic? Nothing. That's, that's a whole different thing that we'll talk about. So axial can be compression or tension. Shear. Shear people struggle with, but it's the force acting in a direction parallel to a surface or to a planar cross section or of a body. Basically, if we have two forces acting opposite each other or one force and a reaction, uh, it's what's happening at those planes in that depth. So if we had a deck of cards and I held here and here and shifted like that, it's what's happening at that plane. But if I did this with the deck of cards, I have this side going down and this side going up. And what we're talking about with shear is what is happening at every single one of these planes within the deck of cards. And then we look at it over a distance. Now, some of you who are good at math are hearing, hearing in the background, ooh, that sounds like calculus. What happens in infinitesimal increments over a series of data points? Well, we're we are talking about calculus and shear and moment and deflection, they are all related to each other, but that's way beyond the math of this course. Shear, what happens when we slip two planes beside each other? That's really what we're talking about. Bending, the force that acts to bend a component putting one side in tension and one side in compression. I have a beam, I bend it. The top is in compression, the bottom is in tension. And you can see that the top squished and the bottom stretched, just like our axial uh, compression and axial tension forces did. If I bend it the other way, the top is in tension and the bottom is in compression. So depending on what way we're bending it, one side is in compression and one side is in tension. Anyone want to guess what happened to the length of the pink line in every single block? That's for later in the term, but just start thinking about that. You can see the top squished and the bottom stretched. What happened along that pink line in the middle? Torsion isn't in this course, but torsion is kind of a combination of shear and moment. We're twisting and we're looking at how that rotation impacts things, but along a sequence of planes beside each other. Connections. We often have to look at the connections as well, and that can be a combination of shear, axial bending, and torsion on local elements, and whether it's ductile or brittle. 
So we analyze the connections as well. We're not going to spend any time talking about connections in this term in this course, but you have to understand that it is a sub is something that the engineer designs as well. So the best way to talk about what these things look like, I find, is to talk about um, how their failures look. So what I'm going to show you is a series of failures. So these are the ones that did not work. But I think it really helps you see what these things look like. Like I said, there's not a lot to test on in this lecture. You should know about factor of safety being the old way we did it and um, limit state design being the way we do it now. And you should have a grasp of what these pictures possibly represent. Um, but some of this assignment is going to be a participation part where I expect you to think about it um, shoot and click that you thought about it and then um, but I want you to think about it and then you'll see the answers from me so this is concrete compression you can see they take this block of concrete and they squish it until it pops out the sides here same with this timber or this piece of wood as well they've squashed it until it's compressed and busted out of the sides it's funny how both of them bow out like that when they failed. Axial failures for tension, when you pull on it and it stretches until it fails. Here's a shear failure. This one's really easy because people can really get their head around it. You can see that we've got two sides slipping past each other. There's only one plane there. But look if you drew the bolt in here. The bolt is acting on that angle there. Very similar to when we put these deck of cards in shear and you could see it sliding on that angle. That is what's happening to the bolt in there. And look at this failure in the concrete beam when it fails. It seems to be following that same line or that shifting motion that we're talking about. So this, this kind of diagonal line in concrete is a really good indication of a concrete beam failing in shear. This is another shear failure, shear failure. In this one, imagine this is our wall and we have a load going sideways at the top and the ground holding it still at the bottom. Now, what kind of things makes a building push sideways? Well, we have wind and we have earthquake. Look at this one. The failure was in one direction and then it stopped. And this one has failure in two directions. When we get a big windstorm, you, you would rarely get reversal of load. Yes, I know a hurricane, if it went over a spot and you went through the eye, you could get the wind reversal happening over you, and you can, but usually one side of the hurricane is less strong than the other side, being from Nova Scotia and having lived through a few hurricanes. You can see the evidence of that, and there's documented evidence of that, that um, what might fail it on one side, to fail it in both directions would be very rare. An earthquake, on the other hand, going back and forth, could fail this in both directions. And you can see that's what happened here. This would have been an earthquake failure on this wall. And I'm not saying this one wouldn't be an earthquake failure. It could have been an earthquake failure as well. Shear failure in concrete. Now I've had this image in here for a long time um, and uh, it unfortunately is a very common way for concrete slabs to fail. It's called punching shear. It's when a concrete slab is weighing down on something and the column punches up through it. So the slab slips down past the concrete. If you tried to balance jello on a, pops, on a, on a toothpick, you'd have a punching shear failure where the column goes up through the element. And that is often why on concrete columns we have capitals or these things that flare out or drop panels, and sometimes we'll even have both, and we'll talk about that later in the term. Here's a bending failure of a wood beam. You can see they have a support on each side and a load coming down at the top. 
I hate this, it's always super weird when I'm gonna use my chin. And you can see it bending it like that. It stretched at the bottom and compressed at the top. And it stretched at the bottom so much that it popped those fibers apart. This is a concrete beam. These aren't the supports, those are the loads. This concrete beam is actually much longer, so off screen are the supports and the load is pushing up on it. And we're getting cracking failure here. So when you see a concrete beam with cracks like this, that's a bending failure. So that diagonal line is a shear failure in concrete and these little cracks are a tension concrete failure. You can see there's a little bit of concrete crushing failure right there, but the failure mode for this would be tension. Concrete is really bad in tension. Concrete is fantastic in compression, horrible in tension. That's why we put steel in the tension side of concrete, because steel is fantastic in tension. Steel bending, well look at this. We, ha we got a little bit of kind of weird stuff happening here, but this would be excessive permanent deformation. We didn't get that like final rupture, but at a certain point, this became unstable. It wasn't strong enough. It bent to excessive permanent deformation, and then it bent so much it wouldn't even sit on the supports it had anymore. So if we had a column here and a column here, it would have bent itself right off of its supports. Torsion failure, again, we're not doing torsion in this term, but you can see that somebody twisted this bolt and it has a torsion shear in it. So it has that, uh, that diagonal line very similar to what we saw in torsion, or in, sorry, in shear. Torsion failure, connection failure. Here's a screw in shear. You can see that kind of, that, that there was a plane there that slipped and it has that diagonal line on it, the same way we've seen in a few other things. Bolts and shear. My guess here is that they hadn't finished putting all the bolts in, expected to come back later. Often when they're erecting steel, they'll put one or two bolts in to quickly hold it because it's really expensive to have that rig there. And it's not a fully loaded beam, it's just its self weight. They'll put it in with one or two bolts and then move the rig on to start installing other ones. And somebody comes back later and installs all the bolts. If it gets forgotten, that can be a real problem because they came in and then finished the building. Now, I'm speculating about what happened here. This is me post-rationalizing what this photo is. Here is a plate of steel that actually pulled apart in tension. Here is exactly like when somebody tipped me over with my foot. My foot came up off the ground well, if somebody had been holding my foot down or if we had nailed my foot down to the ground, it would have held itself down until maybe it tore whatever that was up out. And so that's what happened here. What you can do to solve that is spread that connection out like this. So this looks like it was a moment connection that didn't get designed properly. I know I'm talking about a lot of things here and we're going to go back and really dig into these going forward. So stiffness. How does something fail in stiffness? Well, we have um, vertical, horizontal, rotational, soil, and vibration stiffness. For the most part, we're going to worry about vertical deformation and horizontal deformation. So this or this. Um, stiffness, don't worry about this. It's just talking about uh, stiffness and flexibility are really two sides of the same coin. Um, uh, something that's stiff isn't flexible and something that's flexible isn't stiff. They're just two ways of talking about the same thing. So stiffness, what sets the guidelines? Well, there's comfort, preservation of finishes, Stability, which I know is a whole different thing we worry about, but they can all be related. Drainage, and interface with building elements. So how things work together. So what we're talking about here is 
not life safety, uh, but how things hold up to people using them, essentially. So preservation of finishes is about cracking of our finishes. Interface with building elements is, as our element deflects, does our shoe that holds our glass window in rack too much and pop our piece of glass out? Or literally bust our piece of glass? Um, so we'll go through some of that now. These are the serviceability limits um, that I've taken from all the different codes. Remember I said that there was the steel code and the wood code and the concrete code. There's also a masonry code as well. Um, these are the criteria that come from all of them. I have also uploaded this to Quercus. It's in um, the module for this lecture and it's in the downloads folder as well. So it's in both spots. These deflection limits depend on what material it is, what location it is, is it a floor or is it a roof, and the type of finish that it's seeing and the type of load. So location, is it a floor or a roof? The type of load, is it snow load? Is it dead in snow? Is it live load? Is it dead and live? What's the type of finish? Is it susceptible to damage or not susceptible to damage? And you're asking yourself, how do I know if it's susceptible to damage? Well, anything that you're going to see and that can't move much is susceptible to damage. So if you're asking, drywall, susceptible to damage. Suspended tile finish, susceptible to damage. Basically, a finish is going to be susceptible to damage. Normal roofing, not so much. Um... And then we have, is it steel, wood, or concrete, or masonry? Uh, and then we'll often have snow or dead and snow combinations that we're worried about. So you can see some of them I have an asterisk by. And those ones, there's not a published value in our code in Canada, but general practice around the world still uses these guidelines. So for example, uh, a floor with dead and live susceptible to damage, L over 240, or length divided by 240, is ubiquitous. And it was very shocking when I couldn't go back and find it anywhere in the code because it is just universally used everywhere by everyone. So what do these numbers mean? What can we do with this? What does this give us? What we're saying is, as this deflects down, this is the deflection that we're allowed to have. If this is how long our beam is, and we know what material is, and we know if it's a roof or a floor, we can figure out, and then we know what the finish is on it, we know what deflection criteria or what limit of deflection we should allow this beam to see. As much as serviceability is not life safety, I would say 90% of lawsuits are about serviceability or finishes, not about life safety. It's almost always about serviceability. Owners do not like cracked drywall. And so knowing that we've met this criteria, even though the building is very, very, very safe, because this does not mean it's not a safe building. It just means it hasn't met its deflection criteria. If we're talking about the height of a building, we are talking about how much it can move laterally at the top. And are we talking about wind? Well, the deflection limit for wind is its height divided by 500. And for earthquake, it's its height divided by 50 or 100. And it really depends on uh, it depends on the type of building. I'm not going to test you on the earthquake ones unless I explicitly uh, tell you what criteria to use. But for wind, we know it's H over 500. So let's look at an example. What is the amount of live deflection in millimeters we will accept for a wood floor beam with drywall that spans 10 feet? So first off, these, these, this math isn't hard, so I'm not going to write it down. Normally, I would like flip my camera down so you can follow along with my hand calculation. But these ones are kind of low key. We want to switch our 10 feet in 
to meters just because I'm going to ask for all of our information in metric or millimeters. Let's even put it in millimeters. So we have 10 feet. Well, how many inches is that? We know that there's 12 inches per foot, so 120 inches. We know that one inch is 25.4 millimeters. So times 25.4, we have 3,048 millimeters. We have a wood floor beam with drywall. We know drywall means that it's susceptible to damage. Let's go back. We've got a wood floor beam susceptible to damage. So live would be L divided by 60 and dead and live L divided by 60, 360. So they wanted live load deflection. So we know it's the length divided by 360. We know our length is 3,048 millimeters. Divide that by 360. We get 8.47 millimeters. We'll look at that. We've got that worked out right here. So we've got a worked out example. You're going to have one or two, you're going to have a few of these in your assignment. And I know for sure you have one of these in your quiz. I can't remember exactly. It might be two of them, but it's just what material is it? Is it a floor or a roof? Are there finishes susceptible to damage? And we know that drywall is susceptible to damage. What is the amount of wind deflection in millimeters we will accept for a building? that is 12 4.2 meter stories tall. So we have 12 times 4.2 meters. So 50.4 meters tall. They want our answer in millimeters. So I'm gonna multiply it by a thousand. We have 50,400 millimeters. We know that for wind deflection, it was H divided by 500. So let's divide that by 500. We get 100.8 millimeters of allowable deflection. So without anyone even batting an eye, we're allowed to get four inches of movement at the top of that building. So here it is worked out. So vibration. Vibration is another thing that we worry about. We have continuous vibration a steady repeated load. Um, uh, so, sorry, we have continuous vibration is one of our vibration worries. And that is a steady repeated load. That's often dancing or music, something where you get a repeated thing happening. It's often at 2.5 hertz because people often move at 2.5 hertz. I usually get the class to stand up and raise up on their tippy toes and go up and down slowly. And it's really hard to do. I often then try to get people to do it really fast and it starts to burn your calves. And then I ask everyone to just do it at the rate that feels comfortable. The one that you could probably do for a long time. And most people are moving at the same rate because that's gonna be pretty darn close to 2.5 Hertz. Now, um, transient vibration is how a load that someone else does impacts someone else sitting over here. So if I had somebody sitting in this chair and I went like this, how does that impact them? And does it keep happening? Does it die out quickly? That's what we want to know. And so we'll often do a heel drop to test that out. And if the load is damped, that's good. We want that rate to die off quickly. And that is usually dependent on mass and friction of the elements within the building working together. So this was the big one that we were worried about with that Olympic weightlifting uh, uh, area in the Gold Ring Center. Um, vibration uh, can actually amplify. So you've probably all heard the stories about bridges with amplification being a problem. Uh, so this can be human movement, wind, or seismic. I have a really good video that you guys can go and watch um, if you want about amplification of wind load on a bridge. We can have vertical deformation. 
This was actually in my uh, old house when we were renovating. It was a tiny little crappy house. And uh, we had put um, stuff in the attic, assuming reasonably so, that this was a beam here. So instead of being a nice hefty beam like this, spanning that opening, it was uh, a two by four on flat like this. And when we opened it up, it had a lot of deflection. It was like millimeters of, or it was inches of deflection. So we jacked it up and put in a new beam. It had been a two by four on flat and we needed three two by eights in its strong direction. So this is what we're trying to avoid, cracked finishes from deflection. Masonry you saw had some of the tightest deflection criteria. This is why. It doesn't take much to show a really significant crack in um, masonry. So we has, it has the tightest uh, criteria because it is the least forgiving. Wall movement. This is a wall being loaded from uh, the side by, uh, by earth pressure. Uh, and this block wall doesn't have rebar in it resisting that load, so it's cracked. Lateral deformation. I love this image because it really shows lateral deformation. And look at that. We've got our building like this with lateral loads on it and it has shifted like that. And it has shifted to the point that it's actually collapsed. Uh, this is a video if you want, if when you open this lecture, you can go uh, copy and paste this uh, to a browser. I really like this one because it shows um, uh, a tune mass dampener in a building uh, experiencing an earthquake. And you can see everybody moving around, trying to stop themselves moving with the building, except one person holds on to uh, uh, a feature in the building and it doesn't look like they're moving. But that's because the camera is attached to the building and she's now holding on to the building. So it looks like she is not moving because she's moving at the same rate as the building. This is the Tacoma Bridge Collapse that um, actually shows amplification due to wind on a building or on a bridge. So it's amplification where the building moved at the same frequency as the wind until it finally actually made the bridge collapse. So this is where I say what could be a strength failure could turn into a deformation problem. We saw that steel, that piece of steel that folded up like this started as a strength failure until it turned into a deformation failure, which then turned it into a stability problem. So these things are all related, but there's usually a key one that sets it off. So stability is, as much as it's the one that you guys intuitively know, it tends to somehow be the hardest one to talk about. We are going to learn a method to talk about these called free body diagrams. And free body diagrams are where we draw the things that make something stable. What is stopping it from moving or tipping over or sliding? And that's where a free body diagram is where we draw that. We also draw the things that are trying to make it tip over, slide, or squish down into the earth. So uh, a free body diagram is about drawing all the loads but also the reactions. And we want to make sure it's stable. So sliding is when we have enough weight that it's not going to tip over, but there's enough force that we exceed the friction and it slides across the ground. Tipping is when uh, we have enough lateral force and maybe we don't even have enough weight to stop it from, from getting to the point that we're worried about friction, we have enough friction to stop it from sliding, but we don't have enough weight to keep it from tipping over. So we have lots of friction, but not enough weight, and it tips over like that. Um, elastic stability is when, um, if we have something that's a little bit out of skew, it's not perfect, and we load it. As we load it, it moves a little bit. And then now it's off center even more, so it moves a little bit more. And we do that calculation again and again and again. And if we see that the difference in the deflection gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it's stabilizing. 
If it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we have an unstable solution. Ponding is the same thing. If we put water on a roof, we have a little bit of deflection and that fills up with water. So we have more water right here, which means it's gonna to wanna to deflect a little bit more. So we do a calculation and see how much it deflects and then we count the new amount of water, how it's shifted so it's loaded heavier here, and then we calculate it again. And we do that a few times to see if our increments of deflection have gotten smaller, if so it's stable, if they get bigger, we know we have a ponding problem that's going to cause a failure. Buckling is an instability resulting from a compressive load. So if I squish this, it moves sideways. It's not failing because it's squashing. It's failing because it's popped out sideways. Remember when I talked about that elastic? It worked great when I stretched it, but when I tried to push it, it did that that's because it failed in compression. It doesn't have any ability to take compression. A column can take some compression, but if it's slender, it's going to try to buckle. Local buckling is not when the object as a whole buckles, but when an element of it buckles. And the best one to show you that is uh, in the images. And so I'll show you local buckling versus overall buckling as we look through these images. I know this lecture is taking a little bit longer than I intended, so I'm, I'm speeding up on this. So this is a great one for tipping. Uh, it is not normal that a building would fail in, in a tipping manner, but for this one, there was a hole dug on the side and they piled up soil on the other side and it actually caused the earth to shift and the building to tip over. People always get caught up by these tiny little piers. Those probably actually worked just fine for compressive load, but not for the building to be tipping over. Sliding. I do not know what caused this building to slide here. Uh, I'm guessing maybe flooding. Uh, regardless, it's not a normal occurrence for a building to slide either. Ponding, you can see that they put a new mechanical unit here, which means it increased the weight locally, which means we have a little bit of water, which now that, that increases the deflection, which means more water will pool there. And we wanna make sure we don't end up with a stability problem. Lateral torsional failures, uh, that is when Remember we said that compression causes buckling? Well, when we bend things, we have compression on the top. And compression on the top, let's do it this way. Look at that. As I get my compression on the top, it actually tries to pop out sideways. On the side that's in compression, we get a, a, a buckling problem, which we call lateral torsional failure because it actually causes it to twist. Here is overall buckling. You can see the column is buckling sideways. Here is when I was installing that beam. Uh, we pushed the jack until the post, a wood post actually buckled. Anyone who's ever taken the train knows hot days are horrible and they slow down the trains and go really, 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 really slow because in the heat, these rails expand and it doesn't take much uh, for them to knock these pins out. They're trying to expand and they could actually buckle. So here is local buckling. This whole thing hasn't popped out sideways, but just this flange has some local buckling in the top flange here. Here's another one. The overall beam looks fine, but look at that local buckling. It's localized to an element of the object. And remember the other steel column set up like this, the whole thing buckled, but this one, yeah, it's moved out sideways, but look at how this side wall is warped. That is local buckling. Just some images of some thin shell elements. If you want, um, you guys can watch these videos. They are embedded in the lecture. They're just for fun. They show some, fa some failure modes that are kind of neat to watch, or I guess it's just the one of them. So in structural design, your job is to ask yourself, is it strong enough? 
and that means moment, shear, axial, and torsion. Is it stiff enough and is it stable? And we need to do that for every, for the building and every system, the elements, every element, and the connection, every connection. So we have to check strength, stiffness, and stability for every system, every element, and every connection in the building. And that is what we are doing. So what are your tips? You should know where you fit in the design process. You should understand that there's different types of strength failures, and you should be able to recognize stiffness and stability issues. So that's just good practice as an architect. What do you need to pass the course? Well, you should understand some of that basic math. You should understand the different types of strength failures, recognize stiffness and stability issues. You should be able to calculate factor of safety and limit state design questions. Now, remember, capacity needed to be greater than the factored load for the factor of safety, which isn't the method we do anymore, and limit state design, we need to have the reduced capacity be greater than the factored load. And you should be able to calculate allowable deflection. You saw us do uh, two examples of allowable deflection where you pick them off the chart. So that's lecture one. Uh, we'll be back next week, guys. Have a great week. Enjoy your first week of school.